So my name is Adam Granitz, and thanks for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I want to uh, talk about something that our company has been specializing on in the past few years. Uh, it has several pieces. The official title, as you can see, is Full, full Stack Web Development and Interactive Data Exploration and, and Analytics in the Cloud. So that's a lot of different topics in one talk. So I'm going to try to break that into several areas. And the first area that I would like to talk about is full stack web development. Uh, just a little background on our company. So basically, we are the F Sharp company. Uh, how many of you here are developers? That's more than half, I take. Have you, have you heard about F Sharp? See some yes, some nods. OK. <clears throat> All right, uh, I don't want to make this talk too technical. Uh, but I do want to actually bring out why F Sharp is our choice uh, here for a cloud-based application development and why it's a good language to actually uh, write cloud-based applications. So I have a few slides on some technical stuff, but I promise it's not going to be that very detailed and very technical. So my whole background, my entire life is around functional programming. So I, uh, I represent the functional programming uh, community here. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP. It used to be in F Sharp, now it's just .NET. Uh, so this is my uh, seventh year, actually. And I have co-authored uh, five F Sharp books with Don Syme, who is the designer of F Sharp at Microsoft Research. And I speak in all kinds of events like this. It's, a, again, a pleasure to be here. And thanks for uh, joining us on this session. So here are the books that I talked about. If you're interested, uh, the last three of them have all the stuff that I'm going to talk about as a separate chapter. So if you're interested in functional and reactive web development, that those are the books to get. OK, and our company, we had been basically doing F-sharp uh, services, consulting, training ever since 2004. We were the first company worldwide specializing on F-sharp. And uh, we are based in Budapest, so just a 10 hours drive away. <laughs> I actually flew, but it's a nice drive otherwise. Uh, one thing I do want to actually point out uh, is the extent of the F-Sharp work. A lot of people and a lot of companies are exploring the potential of using F-Sharp. So as you can tell, we had been using it for over uh, 10 years. And uh, basically everything we do is in F-Sharp. So we have over 300 F-Sharp uh, projects. And a lot of the things that you can talk about F-Sharp projects but one of the core things that I should mention here is that the, the time span to implement applications is dramatically shorter. You actually get things done much, much faster in F-sharp. So this is one of the reasons why we use F-sharp. But then I'll have some uh, slides about the technical reasons as well. So here's a quick agenda. I want to introduce uh, functional and full stack web development here using F-sharp and using WebSharper, which is this open source framework that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to show some actual code and this is why we had some technical issues here with the laptop. I wanted to use my laptop so I can actually show you guys uh, some live coding and so on. So I'll, I'll do uh, that in TriWeb Sharper and Cloud Sharper. And I'll have a few words on App Sharper, which is our upcoming uh, open IDE, so to say. So why are we using F Sharp? Well, first of all, it's a functional programming language. And as such, it has many of the things that make it very amenable to uh, the computing needs of today. For example, cloud applications. The reason why cloud applications are good is because they can be scaled. But scalability doesn't come just naturally. You, you can't just say, hey, I just have another virtual machine, and we have two of these virtual machines executing at the same time. Scalability has to be accomplished throughout, through programming. You have to design your applications to be scalable. So blindly scaling is not going to just actually benefit you. It's going to increase your throughput, but it's not going to have any measurable impact on your application. You must code your applications in languages that make coding such cloud applications easier. So functional programming gives you a tool to make applications. And for example, let's jump into this. One of the key things is immutability. Immutability means that you don't have a concept of variables, like most programming languages have variables, like C-sharp, Java, you're dealing with objects, uh, mutate, etc. You can do that in F-sharp as well, but one of the key things, key concepts, a functional programming concept is immutability. So here's an example. So on the, on the right-hand side, 
you have what the compiler thinks of your left-hand side. So if you read the left-hand side, it says let x equals 1, and then let x equals x plus 1, and let x equals x plus 2. So this seems like I'm changing, I'm mutating x. But in reality, the compiler rewrites this, and you have the right-hand side, and basically none of the uh, bindings or the so-called variables are ever changed, so there's no mutation. And therefore, the compiler, after this simple transformation, it can, it can compile your code into a code that doesn't use mutation. So at, at that point, you can scale the application. You can move parts of the application in different cores, even different machines, different threads, if you happen to be uh, on a parallel and distributed uh, programming. Um, so you can do a lot more, and you're more free as a, as a, as a, as a tool to move your application into a more performance state. So this transformation, by the way, is called single static assignment. It's, it's one of the simplest things that functional programming uh, books, textbooks tell you. So this is like, like functional programming 101. All right, so some key data structures. I really don't want to go technical. One of the things that we do use actually a lot is discriminated unions. These are the same as uh, normal unions that you may have seen, except they have a discriminator, like a, a name, a label and then you can do pattern matching on it, which is another device in functional programming. Uh, most of the functional data structures that we use are actually immutable. There are some notable ex exceptions, including the arrays and some mutable reference cells and fields in records. Uh, but because the rest of the functional data structures are indeed functional uh, and they are immutable, they make your uh, code more parallelizable and more distributable. There's something here about lazy versus eager. Uh, who, who knows what's uh, lazy programming? I think we all know what lazy programming is. But in the textbook, lazy programming and lazy evaluation means that you only evaluate something if you need the value of it. I can write some program that says compute something forever and then exit. Well, there's no point in computing something forever if we never use its return value. So let's just that code eliminate it. So that's lazy evaluation versus eager evaluation. So lazy evaluation makes it possible to create an infinite list, whereas eager evaluation would make that impossible. And most of the languages that most programmers use are eager evaluating languages. So there's a big conceptual leap that you can make here to actually switch to lazy programming. And once you are in lazy programming and you combine it with functional programming, you can actually write applications that uh, only compute things when they need to compute them, and otherwise they remain scalable and distributable. So as you can imagine, that makes a big difference. Uh, and just one more last slide on functional programming. So basically, functional programming is not because it's functional in the sense that it's working. It's because it's founded on the notion of functions. So you can have uh, functions uh, as first class values. You can return functions from other functions. You can take uh, arguments, uh, functional arguments to functions. Uh, you can do all kinds of very interesting things. And one more thing that you may have probably heard of are lambdas uh, or anonymous functions. These are basically function values that don't have a name. Like there I can say, I have a function that takes a single argument and it adds one to it. That's a, that's a lambda. All right, any questions so far? Everybody's like, oh wow, this is so much fun. Okay, let's, let's uh, well, just one sentence here. So F Sharp, one of the reasons why a lot of companies start to use F Sharp nowadays is because it has some advanced features. And one of the advanced features is units of measure. There's a bunch of other ones like active patterns, type providers. I'll have a couple sentences later on on those. But here's units of measure. You can basically annotate your computations with not just types, but with additional uh, things, in this case, units of measure. So you can say that I have a function that computes a float number, but the float itself is expressed in centigrades, or it can be expressed as Fahrenheit. So you can make scientific computations that actually carry the unit of the measure on the function itself. So the type system can drive you and say, well, here, you're supposed to return something in Fahrenheit, but you're returning it in Celsius and then it can basically type check your code accordingly. So this could have saved millions and billions of dollars on blown up rockets and spaceships that have you know, 
gone berserk and exploded in space because somebody made a, a system, international an SI versus a US uh, system or a, uh, units of measure uh, change or didn't reflect in the code that something was in foot and not in meters. So anyhow, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much all that I wanted to say on F-sharp. I really just rushed through here because I don't want to waste time on that. Uh, the key things I want to show you is um, how you can do development as a service. So what I just said all about functional programming and using functional programming and using F-sharp to write applications, uh, if I wanted to quantify the benefits, in our company we typically observe a factor of five to seven, which is, I think, very significant in terms of the productivity increase that we get from using F-sharp versus using something else like C-sharp. So in other words, we are five times more productive. A single developer, it doesn't have to be a senior developer. You can have any developer. That developer is going to be five times more productive than a, an equivalent C-sharp developer if that developer uses F-sharp. That's a tremendous uh, productivity increase. So now our main question that we are trying to answer is how can you take that development and that capability to deliver applications much faster and how can you make that even more seamless so one of the ways to make it seamless is to put it online so you can get to your development environment from anywhere so like i said i'm going to have three different solutions i'm going to uh, show you today this is number one this is called try web sharper and you can go to the address on your uh, laptops if you want or maybe at home you can try it out, so it's try.websharper.com. Basically you get something like this, where you have thumbnails of different small programming snippets that other people put together, and you can study them and you can also create your own. So when you create, of course you get the code, you get to use F-sharp, you get to use WebSharper, you can save these snippets, and then you can uh, share with other people. So the nice thing about this, so for example, this is my, uh, my own snippets. I have a bunch of snippets that I demonstrate in different conferences. In fact, uh, let's just show you one, on, uh, one of these. So it's a small snippet of about 90 lines or so. And unfortunately, my screen resolution is not very good. And so it is not the internet. OK, let's just refresh the page. And while that's doing it, yeah, which in, in this case, it actually, I, I wanted to show you this. This is the most impressive demo, but it's not going to work unless there's actually reliable internet. But if you switch back, you can find a lot of other things, including games including different things. I, I'm going to discuss some of these later. But I, I'll leave this here, and anybody interested can find hundreds of snippets on this site. Uh, let me move on here with the presentation. So one of the building blocks to make this possible is, first of all, having a functional language, and then having a reactive functional web framework. And that's WebSharper in our case. This is an open source project. Uh, you can find it on that GitHub repo. We welcome code contributions. Uh, just a few numbers on, on the WebSharper users. So in the past, I don't know, several years, uh, there had been a massive increase in demand. So we have clocked, just from our site, 100,000 plus downloads for WebSharper. Uh, but since it's on GitHub, we don't really know how many people are actually like using it in addition. These are the people who downloaded WebSharper uh, from our own website. There's probably a lot of people. I mean, there are dozens of forks uh, on GitHub for WebSharper from different companies and different people using it for different things. It's actually a whole ecosystem. So it's not just a web framework anymore. It's a whole ecosystem. There are a bunch of JavaScript extensions uh, that you can use just writing F-sharp code. You can actually write JavaScript-based applications. And this is where we get the full stack aspect. So you can write the client-side code, you can write the server-side code, all in F-sharp. In, in fact, you can even write the database side as well. All right, so here's a typical application. You can many, many times just use a single file and then have the ser server and the client side in the same code file. So in this one, basically, we defined two functions or two modules for convenience just to group the server side functionality and the client side functionality separate. And we just basically write F-sharp functions 
and instead of just leaving them as such, we annotate them with either RPC or JavaScript. So the annotations you see on those functions, for example, the my client function, as you can see in the middle of it, it calls the server function. So for us as developers, it's a simple F sharp call to another F sharp function. But in reality, in the web application that results once you compile this, there will be a client side functionality which calls back to the server and fetches data. And all the communication protocol using JSON as the enveloping technology and, and marshalling and unmarshalling, that all takes place automatically. So you get this tremendous boost of productivity because you don't have to worry about these kinds of web development details. All you have to do is just write two functions and say this is on the client, this is on the server. And from that point, everything else is automated. So we call this bridging the language mismatch. Here the language mismatch is about using JavaScript or not and using F Sharp on the server side. And instead of this mismatching between the two languages, we simply squash everything into F Sharp and now you can write the whole application in F Sharp. So as you can imagine, you can take this to extremes and we have. So we have different kinds of projects that you can develop using WebSharp. You can do SPAs for mobile applications. Uh, you can do client server applications. You can do HTML applications, which are basically just HTML and JavaScript. Uh, and you can have any hybrid combination of any one of these. So you can have a, a single page application that has a server side, that is a service, etc. You can all express in terms of these uh, different three main types. So WebSharper is not only a translation engine to take from F Sharp to JavaScript and bundling applications. You can also do all kinds of web-based abstractions and these are the ones that actually make you powerful and, and, and very productive. I'm not going to go through these because those would be each at least one uh, talk, uh, but I'm going to highlight some of this just real briefly. So for example, sitelets. If you wanted to write a server-side application, like a, a web service or uh, an RPC endpoint, this would be the hello world of WebSharper sitelets. This actually creates an application that does nothing else but returns hello world for every single request. As you can see, it's very simple. It has some basic declarations and then application.txt, which takes a function which, from any given context, produces nothing but hello world. So this is not very exciting, so you can kind of imagine that, oh, what if I want to, instead of returning a text, a string value, what if I want to return HTML, like markup? Well, then you can bring in different helper libraries like uinext.html and uinext.server to construct HTML on the server side and then re you return it uh, for the request. So in this case, you can say, I have a single page application that basically returns an empty HTML document with its body equaling an h1 tag with the, with the text values hello world. So this returns an HTML document. And then you can imagine that you can do a lot of other things. For example, you could do templating. Let me switch to a templating engine here. So introducing one single line would be able to load a HTML template that you can instantiate and then you can serve that back. So making this small application here uh, a real life application returning a templated uh, professionally designed page is just a matter of another single line. Okay, so the other thing that you can build is basically services which will service your uh, mobile applications and your uh, client side front ends. And so here's a service that actually has a single endpoint where you have to have an integer, an integer uh, argument. And basically, you can fetch the integer argument and produce your response based on that argument. So everything is all automated and, and, and fully packaged for your consumption. So the code base, instead of hundreds and thousands of lines, still remains in the dozens of lines range, for even for larger, com more complicated things. So here's a, a small application with two pages where you go back to the server and you do something and then you have two pages in your application. That's represented using an endpoint type, which is a discriminated union with th those two shapes. And then you have a multi-page application, each case being handled and returned by either home page or about page, which are two functions that generate the response. So this is typically how your applications, your sitelet-based applications end up looking like. In 50 to 100 lines, you can write full web services with even a consum consum consuming uh, user interface. 
All right, so this is on the server side. I want to really go fast because I have 10 minutes left. So I want to now discuss the client side coding, which is the more fun part. This is where we want F sharp code to produce JavaScript. So here, for example, is the, is the example I wanted to show. And I don't understand why it didn't, but anyhow, so I'll get back to that in a sec. So this application is entirely running on the client. It actually goes out to a uh, web service to pick up some data and it visualizes it on the client side. So as such, there's no server side really. So this would be expressed either an, as an SPA or an HTML application. And by the way, this exists as a snippet, so you can always go to that URL and see the entire code. And like I was just wanting to show you, it's about 90 lines. And actually, <clears throat> it goes out to the World Bank database, by the way, uh, for fetching the data. All right, so client-side coding is centered around not sitelets, but something called pagelets. And pagelets basically allow you to construct markup with some dynamic behavior. And in this case, here's a small uh, snippet where we construct HTML. And within the HTML, we are able to express functionality. Like, what happens if you click on that button? Well, in the middle of that code segment, it says, well, go out to the server, do something, and then uh, push the result back to the UI. So this is basically bringing HTML combinators, or the whole full HTML markup language, with the possibility of writing functionality in terms of F sharp into, into the same language. So the more interesting one is how you get to reactive web development. And I, I, re I really don't think we have too much time for this, but just one minute I want to spend on this. So reactive development is about, well, it's about a lot of things, but one of the core uh, ideas of reactive development is uh, two-way binding. So two-way binding would mean that either I have some programmatic means, my application, or I have the user interface, each are in sync through what we call a reactive variable. So the program or the user interface can change the value of the reactive variable. So you have a sequence of these reactive variable uh, values. And if you change on the user interface, then the reactive variable can be programmatically uh, queried for the new updated value. And vice versa, if you change the reactive variable's value in program or in code, then it will reflect on the user interface automatically. So this is called two-way binding. So most of the applications that you see nowadays, including you know, your, your favorite Facebook mobile application and Gmail, all the applications immediately respond to change. They use some kind of a push-based technology and then have a reactive user interface to react immediately and show the results. So this is how they, <coughs> they are structured. Well, what I want to say here is how you can use WebSharper to write these kinds of reactive applications. Uh, without going into details, you can find on those two URLs uh, the actual examples uh, for a small application like this. This is actually a try WebSharper screenshot. So you have the code on the left-hand side, and you have the executing uh, JavaScript code on the right-hand side. So in this case, there's a text box. You type stuff in, and it will basically map that input to different things reactively, and that, that's what it aims to demonstrate. Uh, we have talked about templating, so let me skip that. And then uh, there's all kinds of very advanced things, including data binding on these declarative web forms. Uh, if you're interested in any of this, which by the way is one of the most uh, valuable selling points of functional uh, programming and reactive uh, programming with WebSharper. Please come and see me after the talk. But let me just skip through these so we can actually go on and show you the, uh, the interactive stuff. So the other thing I want to show you uh, for online F-Sharp based web development is CloudSharper. I actually have a CloudSharper session here, uh, right here running. And basically, as you can see, you get a full-fledged uh, online ID where you can uh, basically type some code, edit some code, you can compile it, you can run it, like in this case I can run this and say deploy it locally, and there's my application running within the uh, browser. So you can do this online development and it's quite interesting and everything. Uh, but there's a lot more you can do. So first of all, uh, let me just bring some stuff up from the uh, uh, help system. So hopefully there's internet. 
Looks like not. Okay. Yeah, I have had difficulties with this. And that means that this example won't run either, but no, it did. Okay, so internet came back. So what I just did, I just did a live query to the World Bank database to fetch some data, and I visualized it immediately. And the code uh, was basically executed in this interactive shell, which is this window that popped up. So if, if you observe, here's the code that was passed. So the top about 15, 20 lines is the code that I copy-pasted by clicking the button in the help system. And it pasted it itself into this interactive environment and executed itself. And what it did is, it's very difficult even to, to describe it in a sentence or two. Let me just run a small video here. Hopefully you guys can all see it. So there's the uh, interactive environment. I'm types, typing stuff in the uh, bottom, and then the interactive environment responds immediately that, hey, this is what you typed. And then you say, hey, chart something, and there's the chart. And then, okay, let's open some files. Let's highlight some code in the file, and then let's see if you can execute that. So basically, I just copy-pasted some code, and I'm poking in the code. I open the module, and I call the uh, function that charts something, and I said, uh, this is really nice. So I highlight more code. I execute it. It fetches the data from a local database. I highlight more code, and it visualizes that uh, data that I picked up. So like I said, it, t it takes minutes to describe what's happening, but it's already just, it's almost instantaneous. And I just did in the other demo, uh, instead of using my local machine, I actually went to the uh, World Bank database and picked up my uh, uh, data from, from an online service. So basically, I really have access to just about any kind of uh, data connectors within WebSharper and CloudSharper. Sorry, I lost my position here. Okay, so going back here. So this is a screenshot that basically shows the interactive environment and you studying some code and copy-pasting and interactively developing snippets, executing them, fetching data, visualizing, etc. So you can also do um, local, accessing your local uh, databases, uh, CSV files, or cloud resources, everything, and you can visualize them in, 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 in equal ways. So you can do uh, connecting your, uh, uh, so because this is a fully universal development environment, you can plug underneath any kind of JavaScript technology, but also any kind of server, server technology. So if you want, you can plug in a, let's say, a machine learning library. You can run that on the data that you just fetch using a couple lines of code, and now your code can actually do machine learning and respond and visualize and do whatever you like accordingly. Uh, so first, I have these screenshots because I was told that I can only do a PDF. But after the talk, feel free to uh, come and talk to me. I can actually show you this in action. So here's uh, interactive <coughs> web development where we develop a mobile application and each piece of it I can test locally <coughs> in, the, in the browser as I develop. Uh, so th I call this uh, mini coding, mini scale coding where you have either just a small function that produces something. You can test it already within the environment. There, I'm, as you can see, I'm experimenting with some accordions and some collapsible panels and so on and so on. Here's a shopping cart application you can put together in about 150 lines. All right, and the last thing I want to show, and there's actually a minute and a half left, is <clears throat> the extension of Cloud Sharper to do not only development as a service, but also do the other aspects, things that developers need to do, like deployment, controlling, and monitoring applications. So one of the things that Cloud Sharper provided is uh, development as a service, but it didn't quite uh, or doesn't quite have a notion of being able to not only just code check or type check and uh, uh, verify and compile your applications on a given node, it didn't quite have that notion. And App Sharper introduces what we call a host. So in this screenshot, I have three different hosts, you can probably not see that it's so tiny. So I have uh, AppSharper and my Azure host and I have my laptop. So as you can see, you can even use your local resources like your laptop to actually host an application that you develop in the cloud, which is kind of interesting, but sometimes you need that speed. And sometimes you only have access to your local database, for example. So you can still have a, a, an application running in the cloud, but it's working against your database on your laptop. 
which is really nice, by the way, for doing demos and you know, like quick uh, uh, business presentations and stuff. Uh, you can set up a host uh, very automatically, just clicking a button or specifying your Azure endpoint or running an installer on your laptop. So depending on, on the kind of uh, range that you're interested in, you can get the app sharper host on your machines very fast. And once you have the host, then it builds into your dashboard and then clicking on one of those uh, hosts, you can see what kind of applications had been developed for that host. And you can open those applications and make changes. So at the very end, you can select an application and you can go into its code base and you can change the code base and guess what? You can compile the code base and you can redeploy the code base instantaneously. So this is like me running an entire business on different hosts and all my different cloud resources. And I have all the infrastructure for editing and running and controlling these applications. So that's what AppSharper does. And I think my time is up. So that's all I wanted to say. So if you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to take them. But probably we should talk after the talk. I think this is too much to consume. It's Hopefully you took the idea that it's some pretty advanced and pretty cool stuff. So thank you very much.